and welcome to the forum at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. I know that most of you know these environs well. We are pleased to have uh, special guests with us tonight and a whole variety of special guests in the audience who are returning members of our alumni of various different programs. I have to tell you that the faculty group that has been working on putting together the set of activities that we're all jointly about to engage in, starting with this panel as the kickoff event for our uh, alumni activities, and running through whatever it is that it turns out that we actually finally wind up doing, uh, has been getting more and more excited about this for months. And we can barely contain our anticipation about how much we're going to learn in the uh, next couple days, both about ourselves and about you. We thought, we thought it was possible that if we said we would do a set of things about leadership, that there might be people who thought that was an important question, who thought that was an important set of ideas for us to worry about. And it is a particular ex source of excitement for us because this is an opportunity where, in effect, the government comes to us. That is, all these different people from our various programs who've been off engaged in leadership in America as it exists today come back and can help us to understand what's going on out there. We have some thoughts. We're sure you have many thoughts. And we're looking forward to an exchange on that set of issues. What we hoped we might do over the course of a couple of days is to examine leadership from a couple of different perspectives. Leadership from the perspective of individuals. How does it feel? How, does, how do you deal with the individual costs, the individual uh, stresses that come with exerting force in the society, with exercising leadership in the society? How do groups deal with it? How do groups position leaders uh, and vice versa? And finally, at the social level, how does the society as a whole treat leadership today? We thought it would be useful to start at that level, that is to ask about the nature of leadership in major positions of authority. Hence, we start with the panel that we have tonight to look at these questions. I do have one piece of warning for those of you who are joining our uh, special leadership seminar over the course of the next couple of days. I know a few of you have not yet finished your assignments, uh, but there is still time. For those of you who have not submitted those, uh, we will be anxiously awaiting, and I will be expecting to read those immediately after, uh, after this di discussion. The question that we want to explore with you over the course of the next couple of days is a question about whether leaders can lead, and if so, how, in the society as it exists today. I think it's fair to say that's an open question. Some people say that it's the task of a leaders, particularly elected leaders, to challenge us as a society about our values, to move us with respect to uh, value decisions, to help us to shape where we want to go and to make choices. Others looking at the political environment as it seems to exist today suggest that that's not possible, that leaders, that people, who try to exercise that kind of leadership, who try to shape where we're going, wind up at such a high level of exposure that they can't sustain either the personal force of that or the ultimate political force of that. That is, that the ballot box turns out to be uh, too powerful a sanction for people who would lead too much, that people who are trying to lead, in effect, are sticking their necks out, and that what we see instead is people running from that responsibility. And that leadership is then going to have to come from other sectors. I think it's fair to say that that's at least a, an important question for us to ask. Has our political environment developed to the point now where it is virtually impossible for people to exercise real leadership? Well, I think tonight we put before you a panel to look at that kind of question on the theory that if people are to lead, then they must surely talk. That is, if we are going to be able to exercise leadership from positions of elected authority, then the people who are in those positions must figure out ways to deliberate, to talk, to engage, to debate, to discuss with their constituencies. There's no way to move them other than to engage them. And so what we thought we'd ask the panel tonight to, to focus on would be the questions of how have you gone about doing that? How did you, as an elected political leader, or how do you, as an elected political leader, engage in a useful discussion, a discussion in which people are being asked to confront serious and difficult choices and to make them 
rather than to duck them, rather than to run from them. <laughs> so that's the question that we want to uh, frame. We have a not only distinguished, uh, but a quite remarkable panel tonight to, for looking at these uh, questions. All three levels of government are represented. Uh, we have a mayor and a congressman and two governors. I'll lead you to figure out who's who. <laughs> <laughs> and we have people who have led in different parts of the country and in, so, to some extent in different time periods and different political settings who bring therefore a wide range of experience on this question of how, how does one effectively engage in public discourse these days. Can you do that? And if so, how do you do that? We see around the country as we face it today, people demanding inconsistent things, demanding services without taxes, demanding that government or somebody resolve complicated issues without making them confront tough choices. And I'll just remind our three panelists tonight of the three laws of thermodynamics before we begin. The three laws of thermodynamics are First, you can't win. <laughs> Second, you really can't even break even. And third, you can't get out of the game. <laughs> now, if that's true, we're in big trouble. But I want to suggest to you that I think our panel today can give us some insights about how that's not true, at least with regard to politics. I want to turn first to Governor Roberts to ask if she might tell us a little bit about what she's currently doing in Oregon Governor Roberts, for those of you who have not been following that uh, corner of the planet, okay. that most exalted corner of the planet, I have to tell you in advance, Governor, I'm actually from your part of the world. And I often feel like I'm too far away from your part of the world. For those who haven't been looking carefully at what's been going on in Oregon, Governor Roberts has been running one of the most extensive activities of public discourse that's going on anywhere in the country. Her taxpayers have told her, on the one hand, they want a substantial change in financing, which would, if carried out as it's currently contemplated, probably bankrupt the state. And they've also told her that they don't want her to cut any services. Those choices, to a, an educated outside observer, look inconsistent. And some people are angry with Governor Roberts for not having been able to get them out of that problem yet. And Governor Roberts is dealing with that uh, set of uh, conflicting forces and trying to help people come to terms with them and to resolve them, rather than to pretend what would be impossible, that she could resolve them uh, on her own. Uh, Governor Roberts, we look forward to learning how we might deal with inconsistent choices. Thank you, Dutch, and thank you very much. I want to talk to you about my honeymoon, my political honeymoon. This is not a sex ed class. In November of 1990, I was elected the governor of Oregon. It was a race that I was not supposed to win. My governor decided at the very last minute, just a few weeks before the filing deadline, that he would not seek re-election. The Republican candidate had been in the race for many months raising money and getting organizing. He was the current Attorney General of the State of Oregon for 11 years, the most respected Republican in my state, a Rhodes Scholar, a man of clear ethical standards, admired by the press and well respected by the public. Only one day after my governor announced that he was not running, I announced that I was. Now, I want to give you a little perspective here. My Republican opponent had raised about a million dollars by that point in time. I had $11,000 in my political account. I'm a Democrat, a liberal, a feminist, a civil libertarian, and an environmentalist, a great credential for running. <laughs> but in November of 1990, I was elected governor of Oregon. And less, literally less than five minutes later, the Oregon press announced that ballot measure five had passed, and I'll explain that to you in a minute, and that the Oregon House of Representatives had gone from Republican to Democrat for the first time in over 20 years. Now, let me describe ballot measure five to you for a minute. It could best be described as Oregon's ugly stepsister to Prop 13 in California. 
It is a truly highly restrictive property tax limitation measure that was placed on the ballot by initiative petition and over its five years transition into full force, it lowers local property taxes, which is of course not a bad thing to do, and forces the state budget to pick up every single local dollar in every jurisdiction in the state and replace it with state general fund dollars. The shift cost the state $554 million in the very first budget that I developed. Now I want to give you perspective because that money means nothing if you don't have a place to put it. A half a billion dollars or more out of a five billion dollar budget. That was the first budget I put together. That was the first year of ballot measure five. In the next budget, the one we are now developing, we work on a biennial budget, I will cut an additional one billion dollars out of the state budget and in the next two year budget two and a half billion dollars additional. Now this is a very restrictive measure. <laughs> On election night in 1990, as Oregon's first woman governor, I was handed this wonderful package of challenge. And when I described honeymoon, I described it because this was in fact the shortest honeymoon that any governor in Oregon had ever experienced. I tell people I didn't even get a kiss. <laughs> now, I want to make this political backdrop a little bit more complete so you'll understand the decision making we're dealing in and I want to add a few factors to it. In November of 1990, my state was already faced with a major crisis because of the spotted owl listing and the looming loss of timber supply and thousands of jobs in my state. So we had that major issue already there before the election. Plus, we had just listed, or the federal government had, two new endangered species listing for two major salmon runs in my state. And the likely dramatic impact of that means commercial and sports fishing will be negatively impacted, agricultural irrigation will be overwhelmingly impacted, hydroelectric generation will be impacted, electrical costs will skyrocket, and our shipping industry will be affected. We also face right now in Oregon the, at least in the eastern part of my state, the most serious drought in 75 years. Now, this is a honeymoon that most of you would like to miss. <laughs> I want to describe three other factors that will give you the rest of the lay of the land. You cannot correct the Oregon tax system and change the Oregon tax structure unless you go to the ballot for a vote. There is no other way to get it done. You can't go to the legislature and get something passed in my state and then say, here it is, voters, a nice new solution because we have not only the initiative petition and the recall in my state, we have the referendum, which means any measure passed out of the legislature by a circulation of signatures can be placed on the ballot. It will end up there anyway. Second piece of information for you, the frustration and the anger and the disillusionment of citizens and voters in Oregon is much the same as that you are witnessing across this entire country. So we have that overlay to deal with. They are cranky, they are distrustful of politicians, and they think government needs a major overhaul. And finally, to give you some perspective on Oregon's tax structure, Oregon's per person tax load, both local and state combined, is right in the middle nationally. My voters don't believe that, but in fact, that's where it is. So let's talk for a few minutes about what we've done to deal with what I hope will be the solution to this problem. The backdrop I've given you is literally my backdrop for this term in office. Uh, someone just said to me the other day, the proposals that you're bringing forward, only a liberal Democrat could get away with. And my answer to that was only a liberal Democrat one-term governor could get away with. So you have to understand this is a tough time. We have got to find a solution to ballot measure five in my state or we will literally be dramatically and negatively uh, impacted for decades to come. Now, originally I was planning to do what any good governor would do with the circumstance in their lap. I would simply devise a tax measure, put my name on it, of course, the Roberts Reform Package has a nice ring, <laughs> take it to the legislature, push it through the legislature and get it on the ballot. That seems fairly simple. 
I just convinced Oregonians it was good to change the tax structure, which they had not changed before ballot measure five for over 70 years. But I started listening to my citizens again. I'd been listening to them a lot. I'd been campaigning for nine months, but I began to listen again to them. And it was very clear to me that if I went to the ballot, no matter how good the measure was, that I would not succeed. The polls reinforced what I felt. It said that no matter what we did, we could not succeed on the ballot, no matter what we placed on the ballot. So with my legislature in session, which only meets every two years, I announced that I would not bring a tax plan to the, ba to the legislature. This caused a great deal of excitement in the Capitol for several days. I was not allowed out of my office by my state security people. I also announced that I would not be enthusiastic if they decided to bring a package out of the legislature. This added to the surprise. The next thing we found out as we began to listen to the repercussions of that decision was that the political folks were very surprised, the press was very surprised, and the public didn't care. Now, <laughs> we thought they'd think we'd done something important. They didn't notice. <laughs> So we then followed that with an announcement within a few days after that that I was creating a citizen task force to take a really hard look at reorganizing and restructuring all of the state government in my state and that literally everything was on the table and nothing was sacred. This created some amount of interest as well. Next, we developed a comprehensive program review process within the confines of state government to prioritize literally everything we did in every agency of state government. And what we did was an unusual process where if you were a human resources person, you went over and looked at the budgets in natural resources. We took people who understood government and we sort of cross-fertilized. We just put them in there with their knowledge of government, but they didn't get to gore their own ox and they were considerably more mean than they would have been in their own department. So the next announcement was the one that, that Dutch referred to and the war, one that turned out to be not only the press story but the real change in Oregon. I announced that after six very large, we hoped very large, public kickoff meetings across the state that I would begin a two-month closed-circuit television process called a conversation with Oregon. People who didn't like it called gabbing with babs, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the respect you get sometimes as governor is overwhelming. Now, I felt it was time that we took a whole broad challenge of this kind and gave it to the people who had created the challenge, the citizens of my state. We're going to ask them, how do you feel about your government? We're going to ask them, what kind of a job do you think government is doing? What services matter to you the most and what services matter to you the least? We decided that we would take to them a complete look, a complete educational look at where state and local government got their money and where they spent that money. Now that was a new kind of educational format within this information gathering. And then we would explain to those citizens how Measure 5 worked and what it would do to the state budget and state services over the next five years. So we did these six so-called kickoff meetings and the press said no one would show up because they weren't going to be allowed to make choices. We explained that we had selected thousands of registered voters at random statewide and that they would participate in the conversation with Oregon and that they would help me shape the steps I would take next for the future of the state. <laughs> In the six meetings that we did, more than 6,000 Oregonians turned up, and we did them in rural areas and statewide. More than 6,000 citizens turned up at these kickoffs to talk about and listen about the vision we had for Oregon, about the need to reconnect our citizens with our government, and about my belief that the citizens of my state were more than capable of helping devise the solutions. A lot of people said they couldn't understand I believe they could, and I told them that. Now, I want to give you a little press perspective here for a minute. The press was sort of up in the air. They couldn't figure out what I was doing. So as the kickoff started around the state, these six big meetings that turned out more than 6,000 people, the press asked, what if nobody comes? Well, as the crowds grew across the state, the next question from the press is, what if you can't keep up this momentum? 
<laughs> and finally, as the kickoffs finished and had been overwhelmingly successful, what if you can't find a use for the 3,000 volunteers that you've recruited in this process and they all get angry? Well, it was clear that the press was sort of not with us in this process. They reported, but they had a little trouble with the concept. Well, in October and November, 13,000 Oregonians participated in my conversation with Oregon. And by the way, we used all 3,000 volunteers during that process. These randomly selected voters were given times and locations and sites where this televised two-way conversation was going to take place, and they sent us back the postcards responding to whether they'd participate and what night or day they would be there to participate. They showed up at community colleges and at schools and at public television studi studios and public meetings. And we used our state's new educational television system called EdNet, which basically is a two-way communication system. And we literally beamed me, I felt like Scotty, we beamed me into meetings all across the state so they could see and hear me in every one of those meetings at the same time. I couldn't see my audience, but I could hear them and they could hear each other. Every meeting lasted for at least two full hours. We had spent literally months working on the format, on the handouts we used, and on the famous charts that I used all over the state then and, and I'm still using. And what we did was we field tested all of that information and all of those documents and all of the process before we started. We focused, used focus groups and we redesigned the process several times to make sure it was really gonna work and it worked. Now the state press and media followed the process in the large communities very closely. They watched everything we did. They waited for somebody who hated it and always interviewed them. They always got the headline, person says, why wasn't somebody else asked? And it was great. But in local communities, in small communities in the state, their local newspapers and radios interviewed them over and over and over. Well, John, what did you tell the governor? I mean, they loved it. And so in all these little communities, they got a lot of press attention and the story was run over and over and over about the people who showed up. I did over 30 of these televised encores, more than 65 hours of live two-way television. And then we ended that phase of the conversation with Oregon. And about a month later, as we told citizens we would do, we reported our findings from the oral questions and 13,000 written questionnaires that they had filled out. Let me tell you what we found out. It won't be a surprise to most of you. It wasn't to me, but it was important we reported it. Oregonians believe their government can become more efficient, that we can deliver services better than we deliver them now, that we're over-administered, that we can spend their tax dollars smarter than we spend them now, and they said that over and over in every part of the state. They were frustrated, they feel left out of their democracy, and they were very clear about that. But over and over, we found out that Oregonians cared about Oregon. They cared about Oregon's future. They cared dramatically about education, and they cared about those in need in our state. They believe now that Measure 5 will hurt Oregon, and if we can make government more efficient, 13,000 Oregonians told us overwhelmingly, 94% of them, that they would get involved in tax reform. Now, since the conversation ended, I've delivered a State of the State address where I have announced the beginning of the process of change about restructuring our state government, and I announced in my State of the State the thing that no Democrat in the history of my state, maybe any other state has recently announced, that we were cutting 4,000 state jobs out of the current budget already passed by the legislature, and that half of those jobs would be managers. For the first time in my state's history, the state of the state was run live on three major television stations and on radios all over the state. There was a great deal of attention to the state of the state address more than ever before. There was a lot of anticipation. Everybody knew what I was going to say and they wrote it the day before and they were wrong. We had more viewers than the Wheel of Fortune and we thought that was impressive without Vanna White. I do a great Vanna White. So what we've been doing is to try to do what you always tell people you're going to do, but it doesn't really happen. We are literally working to make our government more cost-effective, more efficient, and less over-managed. 
We are doing it, and it is not blue smoke and mirrors. We are truly doing it. I am causing some anger in my state, a lot of concern in my state, and notable protectionism. My head of my executive department has this wonderful quote he's been using as he talks about people protecting the things we're trying to change. His quote goes like this, in the hot house of state government, even weeds have a loud, loud constituency. We have found it. Everybody says, it's great what you're doing, Governor. Keep on with changing. Keep making those cuts and efficiencies, but don't touch mine. <laughs> These are not people inside of state government. These are people on the outside of state government. We referred to them publicly, or I referred to them publicly re recently as the butts. And, um, you know, it was butt, don't touch mine. And I told them that that was probably the appropriate term. Now, I'm back on the road again. I mean, it's like me and the traveling salesman out there on the same schedule. And I'm trying to see if the messages that we have sent for the last few months are getting through and to make certain that they do. I'm explaining the cuts. I'm explaining the changes. I'm explaining the things we've privatized. And I'm traveling into every part of my state. And one of the things I'm doing when I'm moving around the state is contacting local citizens who went through the conversation on television with me. And we're calling them in to brown bags and desserts and having them meet with me. And we're saying, did I get the message? Important question. How am I doing? How am I doing so far? I told somebody at, at dinner tonight, I had this nephew who used to go out with young women and about two hours into the date, he always used to say, how am I doing so far? Well, you know, how do you like me so far? Well, that's what I'm doing. And then I'm asking the citizens who went through this process, how did you like my state of the state address? Did it say what you expected? Were there surprises? Do you think I got the message? Do you think I conveyed it? Well, we are discovering now that the loud message, the big message we've been working on for several months, which is efficiency and willingness to the government to change, is being heard. It's slow, and they're doubtful, but they're starting to hear. And now we're building another quiet message under that, which is, is really about what the cuts will mean in the next budget. We have tried not to campaign on a strategy of fear. If you don't give us this, this ugly thing will happen. We have tried not to do that. So in my state of the state, I did the first demonstration about the magnitude of a billion dollars. How do you explain a billion dollars to average citizens? It sure doesn't look like their checkbook. It's a very hard thing to describe. So I used the first example cautiously in my state of the state, and I said, if higher education took its proportional share of a billion dollars, it would be $140 million in our state budget. Now let me give you an example, and then I described these four regional colleges. We could close Eastern Oregon State College, Western Oregon State College, Southern Oregon State College, and Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls, close their doors, shut them up, and we'd still be $40 million short of higher ed's portion of that billion dollars. Now, I just said that because it was a nice group of statewide colleges, and I sort of just let it lie there. And we didn't say much about it, and it began to filter. It just began to brew in the state. And about three weeks later, I announced what the correction cut would be, saying, this is not a proposal. This is just a demonstration of the magnitude of a billion dollars. And I kind of laid it out there and let it brew for a few weeks. Last week, I did the state police cut. What we're trying to do is gently begin to make the rest of the public understand what a billion dollars looks like. I would describe to you the results of this process right now as being glacial. After almost a year of work, the most energy I've ever put into anything in my life, the most commitment I think I've ever put into anything in my life, and an incredible number of people helping us make this happen. We have glacial movement. We have people beginning to believe the budget cuts are not what they want to happen in the state, and we have people beginning to understand that we are changing government. But we've got a lot of impatient people in my state very impatient. When will the tax reform come, Governor? Politely. They want to know the timing, and they want to know how I'm going to know when it's going to happen, and how I'm going to decide that, and what process we're going to use. Well, it's very hard to say to people, I'll know it when I see it, kind of like pornography. I tell them, when you've been doing what I've been doing for 25 years, you know when people are moving. 
You don't have to have a pole. You can feel it. And I know they're moving, but they're not ready yet. And I've got to decide when they're ready, whether I'm right or wrong, I've got to decide because I'm the person who's going to pay the penalty if this works or not first. They are changing, and they will move, and they will help us do the tax reform. And when we decide and I decide they're ready, we're looking at a process now to go back to the citizens of my state and have them help us design the tax reform measures. We're looking at taking our entire tax structure and backburnering the whole thing and starting over. Not a Band-Aid, not a, not a filling of some hole or gap, but literally starting over and looking for equity and fairness and stability and flexibility for the next 50 years and asking our citizens to help choose alternatives to demonstrate that kind of a tax reform. The legislature is very uneasy <laughs> in both parties. It is an election year. They know I'm going to call them into special session when I'm ready to do this. They don't want to do it in an election year. But we believe we will have built a cadre so large and a force so loud in our state when the time comes that they will help us get the job done. The advocacy groups and education and human resources and public services of all kinds are there to be ready to help us. The business community is there because they believe major fights will dramatically damage our state. We are ready to go to the ballot as soon as the people are ready to go to the ballot, and we will bring the citizens of our state into the process to deliver the finished product. Now, I want to tell you finally as I close that a lot of people talk about the anger out there in America right now. I have to tell you from my perspective that nobody took government or nobody took America away from the public of this state, of this country. We as citizens let it slip away. We gave it away because it was easier to watch TV or bowl or play golf than it was to participate in the public process of government. And we let government leaders begin to believe that we weren't willing nor were we able to understand the tough choices that they faced in states and nations and communities around this country. But I happen to believe that citizens and politicians are jointly to blame for the problem. And we must reinvent democracy together. And in Oregon, we're going to show that participatory democracy not only works, but it succeeds. And if we do this, we hope it will be a pattern for the rest of this country about how to restore faith in government, participation by citizens, and bring enough information to citizens that if they have the information I have, they will come to the same conclusions. And I believe that's the truth. And that's what we're going to try to make happen in Oregon. And we hope citizens in this country, in every state in this country, can follow the pattern that we're trying to design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Roberts. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. My case was that if you take graduates of the Kennedy School's various programs and bring them back to the Kennedy School and ask them what's going on in the government, you find out interesting things. <laughs> We're very pleased to uh, have a graduate of our state and local program uh, running this interesting social experiment in uh, Oregon. By the way, there will be a quiz at the end of the discussion tonight about how you pronounce the word Oregon. So <laughs> make sure you get it right. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you someone who's actually uh, familiar to Kennedy School audiences in part because this year she is in residence at uh, Radcliffe as a distinguished visitor in public policy. Uh, governor Madeleine Kunin was governor of Vermont from the period of 1985 to 1991. She also is a graduate of our state and local program, one of the early classes we were trying recently to figure out uh, which one, in which it was clear if you sat in those uh, programs in those days, uh, that the participants were teaching the faculty at least as much as the other way around. Uh, Governor Kunin, we're delighted to have you with us again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were talking earlier that what you're seeing on this uh, platform today is 25 percent of uh, the women governors who've ever been elected in the history of this country. In case you're wondering, this is what governors look like. <laughs> <laughs> I must uh, extend my admiration to Governor Roberts for um, the, the 
journey that she is undertaking. And uh, uh, I think we will all watch cheering from the sidelines, safe sidelines, <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, as we see you uh, plunge ahead. But I have to tell you, there is a difference between being a governor uh, in office and being out of office, if only for one year. Uh, I already have this kind of relaxed <laughs> uh, detachment. And I, as I met uh, Governor Roberts a couple of days ago, I, it all came back to me when I came to the Kennedy School uh, in those days. I would have to call every couple of hours to see if my state was still there <laughs> and to if I still had my job and what emergency had arisen. And it really is a, um, a kind of an emergency room job. And I think uh, to exercise leadership in that capacity is uh, probably a good place to look how you exercise it there because you are really visible and uh, you are responsible for just about everything that does happen and that doesn't happen. And uh, the tension of that is, is constantly with you. So if you're wondering why you get more governors to the Kennedy School, probably one reason is it's a nice vacation <laughs> to, to get away, go back to the beautiful world of theory, um, which is, is very, very comforting uh, at times like this. But in all, in all uh, seriousness, I think probably one of the hardest things about uh, governing today, about leadership today, is that one seldom has a quiet, clear form like we are having here tonight. The most difficult part about uh, leadership is simply the ability to be heard, uh, to get a clear message across as to who you are and what you want to do and why. And that is still the first prerequisite of uh, engaging other people in the effort. Sometimes the noise is too large for you to hear what they want as well. It has to be obviously somehow a two-way dialogue. I think in most leadership positions, and I'll talk about obviously mostly from the perspective of, of the governor, there are really two tasks which I would divide in, in, in very simple uh, categories. One is minding the store. I mean, because your, your plate is so large and because you cannot uh, push off the broccoli and say, I don't like it, uh, <laughs> Broccoli gets put on your plate whether you like it or not. If there's a, a, a fire or a drought or uh, some kind of catastrophe, uh, that's where your attention goes. And if uh, some state employee has, has some allegations against him, that's where that day's story is. So that it is very easy to be driven by the minding the store agenda. And the real art form is to mind the store and, in addition, carve out your own agenda that can be crisply and clearly defined. Because if you don't mind the store well, then that predominates the news and that totally blacks out anything else you want to say. But if you spend all your time with that total hands-on uh, uh, attention like the good mother, uh, you will never get the big vision. And I found that an interesting tension in my own three uh, terms as governor. I would say that in my first term, I was much broader in terms of feeling that I had to have a fairly uh, comprehensive uh, list of things to do. And as um, I went on and was reelected, perhaps I felt a greater confidence in that as well, plus I had gained some experience, and I, I felt I could zero in on issues uh, more specifically. But even to do that zeroing in, I think we have to figure out how exactly you do it. Uh, and the times we're in, uh, I think what we're seeing in the presidential campaign, that what you have to get, first of all, before you do anything else, is the trust of your constituency. Now, presumably, you've earned it by getting elected, but trust is very fragile uh, these days. And the, the slightest um, indication of any uh, uh, waffling, of any duplicity, can immediately uh, destroy that trust. At the same time, you have to constantly not only work defensively, but proactively to, to do the things that show that you are 
a, a genuine person who understands people's problems. Now, that's the rhetoric we're hearing in the campaign, but there are, that is really the reality as well. <laughs> and it is, I don't think we fully figured out how you can convey that as a leader, but sometimes it is the very mundane things that you do that make you human, that make you uh, believable, that make people say, all right, I will, I will believe what she says once she begins to talk. <laughs> Uh, I think back on simple things like going trout fishing on the first day of trout season. I'm not an expert, but my uh, Fish and Wildlife Commissioner made me one in a few hours, and I cast in a beautiful trout stream and got a fairly decent picture of going fishing. And probably that, that one picture of uh, you know doing something that I was not expected to do, looking fairly legitimate at it, <laughs> as if I were enjoying myself, which I was. I was. I was just a little nervous whether I would hook him or not. But, <laughs> but uh, it, it helped. And it's all those kind of, you know, governor amongst the people uh, uh, kind of, we now call them photo opportunities. But they, they are photo opportunities, and yet they're not photo opportunities. One has to constantly convey that you are there, that you are not above the process. Uh, whether it's visiting a, 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 a elderly housing unit, uh, so that even as you are building your very specific um, agenda, you have to make sure that you humanize yourself, uh, that you um, convey, for lack of a better word, just believability. Uh, and it, it encompasses a great many things, uh, many of which we, we can't even begin to analyze, but I think we understand. And sometimes I think we place too much trust on simply that the facts and a good program will sell itself uh, without taking into consideration the underpinnings. You do, of course, need the facts, and you do need a good program, and you do need innovative ideas, and you need a way to convey that. But the third thing you do need, in addition, in my view, is the mediation skills uh, necessary to bring conflicting viewpoints and constituencies together there's probably no good idea that doesn't have opposition. I mean, it's just the nature of change because uh, the status quo is always your most powerful opponent whenever you try to make change. So that this, this mediation process is very um, interesting because there's sort of an inside process where you have to deal with the legislature in almost every state. You can't get much done without legislative approval, so you are always taking care to nurture and feed the legislature and, and be nice to it so that it will respond. But then you also have an outside mediation process with different constituencies and, and the press and various groups. And one of the um, problems I see emerging, and it's again expressed in, in kind of a, uh, a, under a microscope in this political campaign is that some of these mediation skills, which are very necessary to the political process, you can't move without it, are not being respected by the public. In fact, they're being disdained by the public as selling out, as being slick, as uh, simply trying to get there and be political. And I think one of the, the real challenges uh, for us in, in this particular period of disenchantment is how to explain that mediation and negotiation and compromise are positive forces in a polarized society. But it is uh, a, a difficult lesson to teach. And uh, in dealing with students, um, the most common question, I'm sure uh, it's a question that you get as well, you know, do you vote for yourself or do you vote for others? Or uh, underneath it often is, have you sold out? Or uh, how often have you sold out? And the idea that compromise is equivalent with selling out is a very difficult one to get across. But what we're seeing in this country, of course, nationally, is that polarization is very attractive in some ways, but it is paralyzing. And uh, uh, people may feel better when they come down on one side or the other and feel virtuous about that. But it, I think it's also um, we're reaping the harvest of that uh, self-imposed purity of a position in that uh, both between the Congress and the President and between various uh, constituency groups, and it creates a gridlock in the political system. Well, the art of governing 
it's nothing new. It's just we have to rediscover it and redefine it and re-educate people about it. It's still some form of compromise, some form of bridge building, some form of, of consensus building that can be positive and creative. Well, let me give you one example of um, an issue that I undertook, which is a more modest in scope of what Governor Roberts is, is doing, uh, but it is an example of what, what I did in order to do it. I must say, the climate in Vermont when I was there, the economic climate was much more upbeat and positive than it is now. And I think a lot of the um, uh, anger in politics uh, arises more vehemently in a period of economic constriction than in a period of economic expansion, and it, it creates a very, very different dynamic. And um, she is dealing with really the gut issues of budgets, uh, which we dealt with every year, but not in such a tumultuous, fundamental change way. What, um, what I did uh, is I began to, uh, as I indicated earlier, began to focus on specific issues and on a specific agenda. And one item in that agenda was the whole area of land use planning and development. Excuse my voice. Um, I'm not trying to imitate Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it as Lauren Bacall. <laughs> Lauren Bacall. I should sound like that. Um, for those of you who remember. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, this was uh, actually a law that, that is now a law, but then it was an idea that we based somewhat on the Oregon uh, land use reform of some years earlier. Um, I sensed, and I think leadership does start out with sensing something. <laughs> now, I mean, you, whenever you have an idea, you have to at least try to connect it to what you see and hear out there coming back at you. And it can't be done just by polling, it's by millions of conversations and, and uh, uh, every, every snippet of information and feedback that builds some kind of a mosaic that gives you a feel for what the public might be concerned about. And the sense was that Vermont was losing some of its um, identity as uh, development was continuing to, to go at a rapid rate, as small towns were feeling the impact of development uh, in big ski area communities, and that the planning process, while adequate, um, really wasn't working. Without going into a great deal of detail on the legalities and the structure of that, um, we decided to hold a retreat. And I say that probably one of the hardest things for leaders to do is to retreat and think. <laughs> and that you actually have to uh, carve out a very conscientious time to do that. And uh, as I look back, those were probably some of the most valuable times when we took our, our administration and we went uh, off where nobody could find us, except one or two enterprising reporters, and uh, also brought in some outside people. And we had a, a retreat on the question of how do we develop a future uh, process that can give us a better capacity to plan at the local level. Now, I knew some of the landmines out there. Uh, I was first elected to the legislature when a law called Act 250 was under siege. That was our, our first um, law that controlled development to some extent. And I saw the anger in the public hearings of local control versus the state. And this, this issue gets at the guts of that. Uh, you know, New Hampshire describes it even better, live free or die. Uh, on one side of, of, the, of the ledger, and I don't know what on the other except um, live free and live uh, would be my uh, motto, but I won't get into all of that. But you, you understand the tension I'm talking about because it gets at the underpinnings of what role government should play in our society, how much restriction should there be on individual economic decisions, and, and who really controls, uh, controls things. So I was aware of the fact that we couldn't just bring in a top-down process. We couldn't retreat and come back with a law, a, a proposal for a law and say, here it is, folks, that we had to have a, a grassroots uh, discussion 
and that there had to be some emerging consensus to, to develop it. And I was quite confident that, that we could do that, but I wasn't quite sure how. Well, the bare bones of our proposal did come out of this retreat. So between my, my discussions, the input I got from various people uh, from different parts of the country and from England led us to a proposal. I then um, appointed a commission. Now, commission is, I'm sure, commissions are sometimes excuses. I've also been accused of appointing too many of them. Have you been accused of that? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes they use as excuses for the governor not acting. But when proposed um, in a certain way with, with true blue ribbon commissions, I think it is a way to educate the public. And it is a way to get input. And this commission, I was fortunate that uh, the former EPA administrator, Doug Costell, had just become dean of the law school, so he could chair the commission. And we had a, a um, fairly broad-based group of farmers, of business people, ski areas. I tried to make it very much across the board. And this commission then went out and held hearings throughout the state, basically asking, what is your vision for the future of Vermont? What should be done about development? Uh, who should control things and how? And we had terrific turnout. And I will say in this case, the press was with us, that we got very good press on the hearings because the, the press also sensed that something should be done. And I guess that's the only reason that the law has survived, that in fact the press has been fairly progressive on recognizing the need for something like Act 200 and uh, has been supportive. The hearings were heady, almost. I mean, they were poignant stories. They were wonderful stories. And we put out a report, and we brought it uh, to the legislature. And there seemed to be great unanimity uh, when we uh, moved into the legislative session. However, when you get to the specifics, <laughs> you know, the devil is in the details. I think you, you, all, you all know that. Then all hell broke loose, and it was very, very difficult to mediate this process that had to go through many, many committees. I would say I put a lot of my political capital into uh, getting Act 200 through. I, I uh, worked with the press. I, I spoke everywhere. I, I worked with different constituency groups. Um, I made it really the centerpiece of that legislative session. And I was very, very confident that this could be a real legacy for the future of Vermont. If we can uh, empower local communities and regions to plan, we created you know, standards, we created goals, we created positions to fund this so that people would have uh, the capacity to actually have the information to plan adequately. It also create, uh, included a land conservation and housing trust fund, which has been very successful, enabled us to purchase land and to uh, maintain low-income housing. It had some other features in it that were very good. Well, to make a long story short, the bill did pass, but with much, um, with much argument, with much tension, with much partisan fighting, and um, much more at the end than I thought, because all of this polarization surfaced uh, towards the end very, very blatantly and very angrily. Uh, the law is still in place. It has been amended once with a positive amendment to uh, simplify some of the goals, which I think was a good idea. And it may be amended this legislative session. There's supposed to be a, a, a part of the law to go into place in 1996. That's what they're fighting about, 1996. So I think it's a, it's a symbolic battle as to whether or not uh, regional planning commissions have the authority to sign off on local plans. Uh, now, instead of being angry at the state, they're angry at the region. Uh, but it's more a symbolic fight than a real one. But I guess what I've learned from that is that it takes constant, constant vigilance uh, to pursue any major change. It takes a major investment of your political capital. And I think it also takes the, 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 the internal recognition that you may, in fact, be spending it all and that uh, uh, it, is, it is a risky position. And I, after I left, the, um, the, the angry forces really mobilized um, much more strongly. I had underestimated them at first. I won't say that this is, the re I, this is not the reason I didn't run again. I re didn't run again for many, many other reasons. And I think 
Now I actually think it would be good if we had a referendum in the sense that it would be good to sort of put these angry voices into perspective because I don't believe they speak for the majority of Vermont. But that's one of the problems, that the angry voices get tremendous play and it is very hard to put them into perspective in terms of their actual uh, quantity. I mean, if you just go to the South African situation for a moment, one of the wonderful consequences of that uh, uh, ref election was that the, the bigots were put into perspective into a definite minority. And uh, unless you have defining moments like that, um, sometimes it's very hard to put them into, into perspective and, and not be uh, overwhelmed. Uh, either let the press overwhelm you or let um, the, can the, the office holder, the leader herself or himself be overtaken. I'm still optimistic that the old-fashioned ways of communicating have to work. Um, you have to do everything. You know, uh, when Dutch asked us to speak, he said, you know, well, is there any one formula? Press conferences, um, getting out on the road, interactive television. I think a leader has to constantly, constantly be out there and expressing his or her message in whatever form is available. But I think we have an additional burden in these days that there is tremendous skepticism so that the first thought in a person's mind when they hear a leader speak is not, I'm going to listen to what this person is saying. Their first thought is, I wonder if he or she is lying. And so that there is, there is uh, almost an a automatic burden to overcome to show that, yeah, you know, truth and honesty are still possible. And even if there is not evidence for that in your own state. Um, the general climate uh, poisons the atmosphere uh, everywhere. And uh, I think just as we all felt the burden of President Bush's read my lips and found it very, very difficult to raise taxes locally, I think we're all feeling the burden of the general anger out there, and that is, that is a reality. I guess the only way to counter it is to do your job as best you can. And I also think it is better to govern and take some risks um, and at least feel you've done what you um, thought you should do and deal with, with the consequences. I think in the long term, uh, people have more respect for people who stand for something than for people who try to be all things to all women and men. Thank you. I know you're learning interesting things as you go along here, too. I'm, mediation might have been on your list of skills to acquire before, but now fly fishing has to be added. <laughs> That's something that you should pick up somewhere along the way. Our third panelist tonight is someone who brings a perspective from several different levels of government. He was a congressman during the Watergate hearings and era, and he was then the mayor of Indianapolis for 16 years. So he's seen quite a lot of water under several different bridges. <laughs> And through many different he cases. may not, through, through many different uh, lenses, and he may not recall this, but I first met him in Paris, where he was at a conference on the developing democracies in Eastern Europe, in which the, at which they were collected a small scattering of academics, theorists, as Governor Kunin would have it, uh, and as well a number of people who were trying to <laughs> grapple with the practical problems of becoming real democratic enterprises. A, issue which remains before them. And I must say, I kept noticing that there were these huddles of people around Mayor Hudnut because he was regarded as a real person, that is, someone who could really tell him uh, what it was like to try to get this task done. Uh, Mayor Hudnut, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much, Dutch Governor Kuhn, Governor Roberts, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be the caboose on the governor's trains of thought this evening. <laughs> I'm uh, delighted to uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, show you, uh, Governor Kunin said you were looking at 25 percent of all the women in American history who have ever been elected governor. Well, I can say that you're looking at 25 percent of all the Republican mayors of large cities <laughs> in America. <laughs> <laughs> ever been elected. And it's true that I uh, was in Congress for two short and undistinguished uh, years. 
And it's true they were the Watergate years, which I wasn't in Congress longer as a Republican. <laughs> the way I tell it back home is that I discovered in November of 74 that so many people missed me that 51% of them voted for me to come home, <laughs> uh, which, which I took as quite a compliment. And then I went on to run for mayor and was reelected uh, several times. And I'm now at Harvard, having climbed to the pinnacle of whatever ladder I happen to be on. Theory at the time. <laughs> this is a tough subject, and uh, I know we want to get to the questions and uh, the dialogue, so I'll try to uh, uh, be brief. But I think it's Im important to say that there are a lot of reasons uh, why it's very, very difficult today to, uh, to lead. As a matter of fact, I, I'm auditing a couple of books across the river, a lot of, auditing a couple of courses across the river at the Harvard Business School. And I picked up a book over there in the bookstore by a gentleman who used to be here at Harvard and then was president of the University of Cincinnati, and now he's out on the West Coast, Warren Bennis, called Why Leaders Can't Lead. I don't know if any of you read it or not, but I just, uh, to set you off on a pessimistic note, I want to read uh, a couple of paragraphs from, from the book. He says, where have all the leaders gone? They're out there pleading, trotting, temporizing, putting out fires, trying to avoid too much heat. They're peering at a landscape of bottom lines. Their money changers lost in a narrow orbit. They resign. They burn out. They decide not to run or serve. They're organizational Houdinis surrounded by sharks or shackled in a water cage, always managing to escape miraculously to make more money via their escape clauses than they ever made in several years of work. They motivate people through fear, by following trends, or by posing as advocates of, quotes, reality, end quotes, which they cynically make up as they go along. They're leading characters in the dreamless society given now almost exclusively to solo turns. Thus, precisely at the time when the trust and credibility of our alleged leaders are at an all-time low, and when potential leaders feel most inhibited in exercising their gifts, America most needs leaders, because of course, as the quality of leaders declines, the quantity of problems escalates. As a person cannot function without a brain, a society cannot function without leaders, and so the decline goes on. I think there are a lot of people in elected positions today who aren't leaders, to be honest about it, who subscribe to the uh, wet finger school of politics. And they take their polls, and then they say what the people want to hear. And this has already been alluded to in the way in which people uh, resist uh, right now anything that smacks of a tax increase. And it's terribly difficult to exercise a responsible approach to government, it seems to me, and uh, not recognize that somewhere along the line, maybe res responsible governance uh, would suggest that you might have to raise a tax in order to avoid dire consequences. Uh, the question, I suppose, is whether or not the political environment as it now exists still allows elected political leaders to lead on questions of values, as Dutch Leonard put in a memo to the three of us, or whether the political setting is now so fractious and fragmented that leaders are forced to follow the flow of public sentiments rather than shape it. Well, frankly, there are a lot of people in public life today in positions of elected leadership who are following the flow of public sentiment rather than trying to shape it and lead it and direct it. And uh, I, I feel badly about that. It's very difficult now to lead. As Mr. Bennis says in his book, there's an unconscious conspiracy at work in America to prevent leaders from leading. And he talks about the message of the 1980s, uh, which were, was that uh, selfishness and, and greed are okay. And he says that people are secure in the cocoons of their own self-interest and people are retreating into their, their own electronic castles and they're cocooning and they, they are suffering from what he calls terminal egocentricity. <laughs> and that makes it hard to lead because they're not interested or they're apathetic. And uh, then you get to the point, as was mentioned by both governors, where they're angry. And so democracy, he says, has become anarchy. And freedom has degenerated into license because people are talking about how I want to be free to be me, but they never talk about how I want to be free to be us. And he draws a distinction between the C words and the I words. And the C words, which he tends to favor, are words like <laughs> caring and compassion and community and commitment and uh, concern and, and the civic and citizen and circle. The I words are I, individual, independence, nothing wrong with some of this, 
But it's all a question of perspective. Isolation, island, ideology, ignorance, id, idiot. <laughs> and he asked the question, is, is it just a happenstance that um, most of us uh, want to be islands or most of us want to be circles and which is better? And he doesn't answer that question, but he says it's a happenstance that the sea is almost a clear cir closed circle where the island's sticking up there by itself. Well, there's a lot of this. It makes it difficult to lead. And I want to focus in on one point which I think is, is important, and that is that the, one of the reasons why it's difficult to lead is because we're living in an age of unreality where people want easy answers and they tend to scapegoat as they look for solutions. Uh, I'll never forget the uh, uh, encounter I had here at Harvard uh, several years ago when I was mayor of Indianapolis and I was invited to come and give a keynote address with Harvey Cox and something that was jointly sponsored by the Divinity School and the Kennedy School on um, religion and political campaigning. And uh, during one of the breaks, uh, one of the persons at the conference who came as, as you'll see from uh, what I tell you, from way over on the right side of the uh, spectrum. And they had everybody there. Father Drynan and Cal Thomas and the Christian Century and the Christian Voice and so forth, that everybody uh, represented some place on that spectrum. And this right winger came up to me and said, where do you stand on right to life? And I didn't want to get into it with him because I knew exactly where he stood. And uh, I didn't need to have an argument right before I ate lunch. And uh, so he pressed me a little bit. And uh, I, I then deflected. I said, uh, don't you care about my views as the mayor of the 12th largest city in the country on uh, education, transportation, housing, uh, job creation, unemployment, uh, making the sewers run downhill instead of backing up into people's basements and all the rest of it? He said, no. <laughs> he says, I don't care about any of that. I only want to know where you stand to right to life. I said, why? He says, because we're out to defeat everybody in public life who doesn't agree with us on the right to life amendment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that made me very uncomfortable, not only because of my own personal views, which were different from his, but also because that's the kind of single issue mentality, the litmus test mentality that we're cursed with today, and it makes it very, very hard to leave. People don't want to face reality, says Bennis, if America has any point at all now, and I'm not sure that it does, it is to avoid reality. It is as if the entire nation has decided to stop facing facts. Well, a leader helps people face facts. The leader, he or she does it with integrity, with dedication, with magnanimity, with uh, humility, with openness, with creativity, hopefully with trustworthiness. But you still have to face reality. Max Dupree, in his book, Leadership is an Art, which, according to the late Sam Walton, is the best book that's ever been written on leadership, says the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. Let me mention three examples, and then I'll sit down, where I tried to face reality and uh, uh, help our community to talk about values. The first had to do with the reality of declining neighborhoods, which afflicts and affects any large a city. And the, I suppose the value that I wanted to try to promote was revitalization and bringing new life back into a severely deteriorated uh, situation. So uh, we got off onto a bond issue with 14 neighborhood re revitalization projects. These three examples, one's a failure, one's a success, and one's a question mark. This is the failure. The bond issue was defeated. The reason it was defeated was because we didn't do what these two governors were talking about. We didn't get out among the people enough and talk about it and educate them enough, and we got no help from the media whatsoever. It would happen in 1985. We were preparing for the Pan Am Games, which came to Indianapolis, the amateur sports capital of the country, in 1987. And we wanted to build a village for the Pan Am athletes that could subsequently be used for inner city housing. Uh, and roll it over into permanent housing stock in the city afterwards. But the media dubbed it the Pan Am Games bond issue. And then they uh, 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 wised off about a, what's relevant between a neighborhood revitalization project in one part of the city and the Pan Am Games. And, and the anti-tax people got into it, and they circulated petitions. And anyway, it went down to defeat. It went down to defeat because we had not done the things that these wise persons did in Vermont and Colorado in terms of building public sentiment. I'm sorry, Oregon, pardon me.
those West I was thinking, the, yeah, all those ones out there that begin with a vowel is a, or end with a vowel. I'm sorry. Okay. Oregon and Vermont. Um, the success, <laughs> the success that I had, or we had, was with building the Hoosier Dome, an $80 million domed stadium without a football team and <laughs> to play in it. And uh, hey, that awesome. took a little bit of brashness. The, uh, the reality that we were facing was a changing economy. The same time as we embarked on this dome stadium, it was announced by AT&T they were going to uh, empty Indianapolis out of 8,700 jobs when they closed the Western Electric plant there. And as all of you know, the times were changing and we were shifting from a manufacturing-based economy to one that was more service-based and information-based. And the uh, value that we wanted to promote through the dialogue with the citizenry had to do with, with bread with work, with jobs, with economic development, with those kind of positive things that get at some of the roots of crime and poverty and all the rest of it. And so we undertook a massive campaign with speakers and radio shows and uh, news conferences and many, many meetings behind the scenes to try to help educate the public about this. I met with the publisher, the newspaper, and so forth and so on. To make a long story short, we did the things that were talked about in Vermont and in Oregon, and consequently, we were able to carry the day, and we built that Hoosier Dome before it was known that the Baltimore Colts were going to become the Indianapolis Colts. The third issue or example that I want to uh, share with you very briefly, uh, where I'm not sure whether we had a success or a failure, was in another controversy that we got involved in in the middle 1980s relative to affirmative action. When I was elected mayor in 1976, the first time, I installed some affirmative action goals. And the, uh, the uh, reality that we were facing there was the reality of racism and sexism that were preventing many, many minorities and women from achieving their rightful place in the mainstream of opportunity in our city in general and in our city hall in particular. And so we instituted not a policy of, uh, uh, of rigid goals and timetables and quotas, which is what the Justice Department accused us of, but just a way of trying to increase the percentages of women and minorities in the police department and the fire department. We were doing that. We were inching along when, lo and behold, in the middle 1980s, the Justice Department uh, sued us. And I thought that this uh, uh, was worth resisting. So I resisted the lawsuit that came down on us from the uh, Justice Department. And it went ultimately all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in another decision, basically, the Supreme Court uh, sustained the position of Indianapolis and a couple of other cities, even though many cities had dismantled their affirmative action program when they were sued by the Justice Department. The value that we were striving for, obviously, was equality, because there's something wrong with our society where women make about 59 percent of what men make for, every, for the comparable work rendered and where the average African-American families making about half of what the, or less than half of what the average white family is making in uh, our country. And so we, we fought for that and, and we prevailed. Now, I don't know whether that was a success or a failure but because I basically had to do it myself. I couldn't get public opinion interested in this. They weren't involved, they didn't participate in the dialogue and uh, there were people who came up to me and, and screamed at me about reverse discrimination and now with the Supreme Court being the way it is, I'm not sure whether we'd prevail if we went up there again on this issue. And I think that's unfortunate. And I said, as long as I'm the mayor of this city, I am going to stand for affirmative action, even if I have to do it on an, a voluntary basis. And if we have to dismantle it, fine. Well, uh, I was elected once uh, thereafter, and then I decided not to run again after 16 years. But we, you have failures, you have successes, and you have some that are question marks. And the lessons that you learn, I think, are that, uh, first of all, the 90s require much more openness and more uh, inclusiveness than has been true heretofore in the decision-making process, and we have to reach out in conversations to our constituents much more than we've done in the past. People are tired and fed up of decisions being made behind closed doors or by a small elite group of people. Uh, a second lesson I think we learned, and I'll, I'll, I'll quit with these lessons, is that I think the agenda item is not as important as the dialogue in a democracy. Uh, thirdly, uh, interact as much as you can, and you've heard these two governors attest to that. Fourth, 
Uh, a lot of leadership is invisible. Uh, they talked about high-profile public positions that they had taken, and that's rightfully so. Uh, she, uh, uh, Governor Kunin dresses up in a, a trout fishing outfit while I dress up in a giant leprechaun outfit on, <laughs> on uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day and march down the street dressed like the jolly green giant. You know, we all have these things that we do, but a lot of leadership is invisible. And working behind the scenes to create the kind of climate where these things happen and touching all the bases. Uh, another lesson, I think, is that, you, is that you can't get the help, you can't get the message out without the help of the media. And sometimes the media doesn't help, and that's already been alluded to. But they didn't help me at all on that Pan Am bond issue, which they called it, which was really a neighborhood revitalization bond issue. And the last message is I think you have to stick your neck out, you have to hang in there, you have to avoid self-righteousness as you do it, uh, you have to hold to strong moral positions without being moralistic, and you can't uh, give up. You have to have the courage of your convictions. Both of them said that. I'll rest my case on that. You, you do your best, and then at the end of the day, you leave the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hudnut. Uh, another list of additional skills to uh, put in the giant leprechaun, I'm not sure some of us are going to be able to do. We'll have to think of a close, a close substitute. It's late in the evening, and I know many of you have traveled a long way to come here today, and as did our, uh, some of our guests. And so I, don't, I want to give you an opportunity, at least uh, for a couple of questions from the floor, before we say uh, good evening. There are microphones down here if uh, people would like to ask a question of one or another of our uh, panelists. Uh, yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> just because uh, of, of what the last speaker just said about the, the, the lack, uh, the supposed lack of uh, leadership in terms of I versus we, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed at the seeming obliviousness to the fact that there is a, a very important candidacy out there that is basing its whole campaign on we the people. So I would like to hear some comment on the, the candidacy of Jerry Brown, his grassroots campaign, the meaning of it, the significance of it, and the fact that when somebody comes along and tries to do what he's trying to do, the establishment circles the wagons and, and does their best to shut it down. I'll let the two Democrats respond to that. <laughs> well. I'll preface my remarks by telling you I support Bill Clinton so you'll get my bias out front. But I think Jerry Brown does, ex does have half the equation, but not the other half. I think half the equation is that he does uh, acknowledge the anger that is out there. And it is legitimate and it's real. And I think uh, a lot of us have not paid sufficient attention to it or it wouldn't have reached this fever point. Uh, where I have trouble is, I see him tearing the temple down, but I don't see how he will build it up. And uh, I think that takes more than uh, the country is broken slogan. And so I think one, one of the reasons you see the established politicians not supporting him is because I think there's an understanding that building is painstaking, and building takes all the processes that people are impatient with uh, in order to work. And I also think there's some feeling that came out in, in the New York uh, primary vote that while it is, it is perhaps cleansing to have this call for uh, restructuring, that there's some question whether, whether you can carry that all the way into the White House. And I think he, he evidences an impatience. Uh, with, I mean, he back, practically said the country's ungovernable. That's what he did say. That, those were his exact words. So I think the people still want someone who, okay, says we need change, but recognizes that you have to eventually govern and deal with, with the realities. I think we're, we can be grateful to Brown on one level that he is accelerating and intensifying the call for change. And I think that will happen. It may not happen according to his dynamic uh, tempo, but I think that's what this election is about. Let me make a very brief comment. I have not taken a public stand on the presidential race, which is highly unusual for me. I usually make early commitments and go out there and take my heat on it. I have not done that this time. 
I, your comments implied sort of a, if you'll beg my pardon for saying so, so, sort of a righteousness about your candidate or your feelings. I think it's very common when, once we take a position on a presidential candidate to feel fairly righteous about our candidate no matter what happens. And I think that sometimes in doing that, we can't stand back and evaluate both the political race, the candidate, and the issues. And I, I think Madeline is absolutely right. Jerry Brown has raised some very important issues, but you, but there is damage to the process in the way he's doing it, I think. I think if we have a population in this country already so angry, it doesn't know where to turn. When you, when you not only use that anger, which may be correct, but play to that anger and then exacerbate that anger in order to win, I think you tear down and not build. And I have great concern about what that means, not only in this election, but in the general election and what it has done, I think, in many ways to feed uh, an already angry population. Other questions that people would like to ask? Yes. Is that, it's Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> You make the point that the, uh, the public is, your citizens are concerned about government and they want a government that is smarter, is better. Um, and I really commend you on the involvement of the public conversation. It's very exciting. One of the concerns or questions that I have, and it, it really elevates attention to me, one of the steps that you're taking is to uh, cut back the, the public workforce. Um, an enormous step and a very difficult hurdle is to get that enterprise of government to work better, smarter, more efficiently, and for the individuals to see their jobs differently, to see their roles differently. One of the concerns I've seen, if I have, and I'm seeing leaders across the country in, in their effort to uh, convey that they're listening to citizens by cutting, uh, is that that further uh, exacerbates a problem with well, first of all, let me say that's a very sensitive question. You've hit on really the the basis of why this must be done very carefully and with a great deal of understanding. When we cut 4,000 positions, and I use the term positions, about 1,000 of those or 1,200 of those are going to be real jobs, real people in positions who will lose. The rest are retirements and uh, attrition generally and vacancies that we didn't allow to be filled that were sitting vacant. As we looked at the process of our, of our government and said, you know, are we just too big? Are we working ineffectively? Are we... Do we have too many administrators and managers? We found that we really did truly have a six to one ratio of, of managers, one manager to six employees. That's a very, very, uh, I think, unconscionable ratio of management to employ. That was a place where we felt we could make changes and still serve the public and deliver services. So a good portion of those jobs came directly out of that management administrative level because we were overmanaged and we're moving into a new ratio. That one we can justify, I think, both to line worker, to other managers, and to the public. So that, I think, was a, a good one as we're making changes in our state agencies and looking for better ways to deliver services is we're literally working very hard to empower or any man manager. We're trying to get employees to help us understand how they can deliver some of the bureaucratic landmines time we're we're making the very difficult choices attempting to do a great deal of communication a great deal of participation and learning from our workers about how them of doing this 
just it's, I have said these people work too hard. I'm not going to balance my people of the state. So I have given them something back in terms of my respect for what they do at some heat and some cost from the public. So I think between all of those pieces, uh, it is going to be a workable, workable liaison as we make the changes and they're actively involved in helping us reorganize state government, both, both unionized workers and managers. So I think we haven't done it perfectly, but I think we've done a lot of things right in the process. Yes, one final question from the floor. Speak up so people in the back can hear the question as well. A question perhaps mainly to Mayor Hudnett, but, but to all of you. I have some sense that all of the anger and the frustration about our society that you all refer to stems as much from failures of the private sector as it does of failures in the public sector. Uh, companies who are mismanaged, uh, which cause unemployment and, and, and a whole variety of causes. And I think the book that you were quoting from was referring to leadership perhaps in the private sector. How do we make the constituencies that you all have make that connection, that there is a connection between private and public sector, and, and make people begin to understand that we're kind of all in this together, and uh, that things have to happen on both sides of the equation to deal with environmental problems, to deal with the economic complexities of, of timber and natural resource issues, uh, et cetera. I think that's a, an excellent observation and, and very helpful, and I certainly agree with the uh, implication that there is a lack of leadership often in the private sector as well as in the public sector that results in the kind of cynicism and anger and confusion and frustration that we've been talking about here this evening that impedes uh, the ability to communicate an effective, effective vision of uh, our values and where we want to be going. Uh, I think one of the ways to uh, get beyond that is to affirm a strong uh, working relationship between the public and the private sector and to put in place uh, mechanisms uh, in, in your own community uh, whereby uh, a dialogue can be facilitated and people can jointly discuss their problems. In Indianapolis, for example, we have a Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee. We have a Corporate Community Council. I have a, or I had when I was mayor, a Labor Advisory Council with all the chieftains, if that's the right word, of labor at the local level who come in once a month to talk with me. And, and you, you try to keep the dialogue going and get them talking, for example, uh, the uh, Progress Committee, which is composed of a broad cross-section of leadership in our community, has dealt very uh, helpfully, I think, Kathy Prosser, who's in the front row and the head of uh, environmental management for the state of Indiana, might disagree, but they've made strong uh, efforts and, I think, good strides in the whole area of uh, cleaning up our air act. Not that we're completely in attainment yet, but the fact of the matter is that the private sector has been somewhat concerned about that and moving in that direction. The problem is they haven't moved far enough and they would not support, for example, a state law that would uh, um, require mandatory vehicle inspection with regard to emissions testing in, in our state. That, that will probably never happen given the way in which rural interests dominate the state legislature. But nonetheless, you get the the movers and shakers and these uh, leaders of private industry that you're talking about involved in the conversation and moving in that direction. And just off the top of my head, the implementation of the public-private sector partnership in, in concrete ways and sustained ways seems to me to uh, be at least a partial answer to the problem that you reference. I just uh, footnote and say, yeah, I, I agree, and I hadn't really thought about it till you you mentioned it. That you know, I think some of the anger at CEOs making uh, incredible salaries. There's this, there's a feeling that mm -hmm. some elite is controlling the country and not we the people. That I think washes back and forth between the private and the public sector. But then I have to pause as I say that and say, look at Ross Perot. So I think even when the private sector uh, abuses its privileges. It is still, compared to the public sector, considered more pure. Um, but, of course, it hasn't been examined ever as uh, closely uh, as the public sector. And I think it would be interesting to see what happens 
uh, with Ross Perot as his candidacy emerges, if it does. Just another note, I think, you know, when you don't understand what's going on, you can either zero in narrowly or try to expand it cosmically. Um, and I think, I think, you know, when you watch the election results um, in Italy and in France, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen in uh, Great Britain today, but there seems to be also a global uh, upheaval going on. And sometimes I think that we've just lost a lot of our old enemies and a lot of, a lot of our old boundaries, and uh, that this has created a kind of subliminal anxiety about who's, you know, what's happening in this world. And uh, it, it's easier when you know who's on the right side and who's on the wrong side. And I think some of the, the, the uh, fearfulness about who is in charge in terms of government also reflects uh, the tumultuous, tumultuous uh, global international changes that we've seen. Actually, the greatest hope, in a way, I see uh, is on one of the very local level where people still can see each other, talk together, they're real human beings, and you can get these coalitions and network organizations going. The other is on the international level, where we actually are um, speaking to one another in um, a much more uh, positive and substantive way on the environment, on, on, on other issues. And um, I think that's what we have to do is fill in all those spaces in between. Well, it, it really is an interesting uh, focus, and, I, and it, it, it was one of those things like Madeline kind of caught me, it made me think. I, I think of how often in government people say to us, why don't you just operate like business, use business principles, use business sense, and if you operated like business, everything would be okay. And I always say, how about the savings and loan industry? And I think the difficulty with making those kinds of comparisons is that you're really comparing apples and oranges in many in many cases and and when government takes its worst hit sometime is when we're trying to make change which business has done dramatically and in some cases very well over the last few years particularly as they've begun to die, downsize and look at their companies and their production and their workforce in new ways as government attempts to do those kinds of changes the criticism will often come sometimes directly from the business community about the fact that you are attempting to make changes that many times require uh, not only legal changes but monetary changes and I describe my my board of directors as being 2.9 million Oregonians it is a lot easier for a CEO to go in and take a company board of directors bring the information to it they're likely to believe the CEO or he will not be CEO or president very long <laughs> and so he brings the information or she brings the information to the board of director and they make the necessary changes they don't have to go out and deal with an electorate or a media or a press nearly to the way that a government does so I think that piece is very different but I do think that in this country right now more than any time I can remember there are new liaisons which I think are positive ones not negative ones occurring between business and government right now on education issues the, the, the businesses of this country have understood that education is critical to their future not just to government not just to schools and colleges but in fact to all of us they have now begun to understand that in the era of, area of workforce training and preparation in many of the things that were it really seen as government's basic Bailiwick before are now seen as a mutual responsibility of government and business. And so my hope is that where business makes mistakes, maybe we in government can say this is a place you could behave better. And as we make mistakes, maybe not only our citizenry but business can say that to us. And mutually, we may do a better job in this country. I want, uh, with you, uh, to thank our panelists. Since we each had a, this seems like an appropriate moment to call the formal uh, part of these proceedings to a close, and maybe we can have some uh, less formal interchange here if people want to stay around for a little bit. But I, I do want to thank our panelists for being here for this most interesting and variegated tour of different levels of government in different places. And if you're anything like me, it was also, uh, for me, an inspiring tour. Uh, I heard us talking about some of, or framing, some of the problems that I hope we can work on effectively over the next couple of days. I think we need to bear in mind, one of the reasons it's so hard is that government is where this society has chosen to put its hard problems. Anytime we've got something that we can't figure out, we give it to the government to try to worry about for us. 
We heard some, I think, quite interesting characterizations of what leaders do. Uh, one of them that I think underlay the comments of all three panelists and was voiced uh, quite specifically by one is the notion that leaders help people face the facts. How does, do leaders do that? Can leaders do that and survive the ballot box test? And what does that, doing that, what does helping people face the facts require of you in terms of skills like fly fishing and uh, other skills, mediation and so on? What does it require of you in terms of personal courage? What does it require you in terms of reserves of energy and stamina and the ability to keep going when people are angry with you and not afraid to tell you that? These are the kinds of questions that I think the panel has very effectively framed for us that we want directly to explore with you over the course of the next couple of days, and we're very excited about uh, doing that. I've been uh, teaching at the Kennedy School for uh, 13 years. I've had many occasions to be proud of things that it was involved in or things that it was doing. But I'm especially proud tonight uh, to be associated with an institution that is associated with so many people who are actually trying to lead rather than uh, merely to follow. And I include in that our panelists as well as the audience. And I look forward to working with you all over the course of the next couple of days. I want to express the Kennedy Schools and my personal appreciation to our panelists tonight for being with us and very much appreciate this, I think, quite inspiring kickoff for the work that we've got to do starting early tomorrow morning. I look forward to seeing you all there. <laughs>